Okay, so I want to go back to uh, Rudolf Steiner um, and look at um, his overall model um, for spiritual development. Especially, I want to focus on this idea that he had about the descent of the Archangel Michael onto the physical plane in the year uh, 1879. Um, and I'm using this book, this, uh, The Archangel Michael, His Mission, and Ours. Um, but in order to understand the context of this, we have to sort of review his whole sort of worldview. What we're looking at here are, these are Earth incarnations in the development of man. And they go through old Saturn, old Sun, old Moon, Earth, new Jupiter, new Venus, and then finally Vulcan. These are planetary bodies, but they're actually etheric. They're, they're astral planets. Every physical planet has a sort of astral double or twin that exists uh, uh, for Steiner on the astral plane. So that everything that happens on the physical plane has already uh, been set and thought and planned out by spiritual beings on the metaphysical plane. And so old Saturn isn't the planet Saturn but the seeds for the minerals of today's physical body were worked out. Um, yeah, and then for old sun, not the literal sun yet, uh, plant life, the etheric body was worked out for plants. And then for old moon, the astral body was worked out for animals. Then it's not till you get the earth phase when man shows up incarnate now. Man has already existed um, from what I've learned from talking to uh, mediums, souls were invented about 3 billion years ago, shortly after the actual solar system came into being, which came into being 4.6 or so, about 5 billion years ago. So Steiner is right in that human beings were there first, before animals, on the astral plane. So everything solidifies when you get down to that earth phase there. And then evolution takes place, um, animals appear, souls are incarnating in animals, and it takes a long time to prepare the right physical monkey bodies as, you know, with the proper brains for humans then to begin incarnating uh, as these fancy monkeys, which we are, um, except that we have uh, a capacity for self-conscious self-awareness that neither animals nor plants have and certainly not minerals. So everything solidifies. The earth plane is when the solar system emerges concretely. And it wasn't created, you know, the paradigm that we see is that uh, it's the billiard ball effect of planets crashing into each other. It's not quite that way. There were spiritual beings guiding the shaping of the solar system. And I'll give you one example of, of one thing I've learned uh, that, that Steiner was sort of right about. Uh, right in, in a poetic way. The extrusion of the moon from the earth. So we know that about 4.5 billion years ago, a rogue planet named Thea crashed into the earth, and from that debris, it formed the moon. That was not an accident. Thea was sent to the earth to extract the moon from it so that life on the earth could take place. And as Steiner says, if the moon had stayed in the earth, um, it, the earth would never have been sort of soft enough. It would have calcified and been too hard for beings to incarnate on the earth. So the moon had to be pulled out because the whole plan was to create the earth as, uh, in a way, the center of the universe, not just the solar system, but the center of the universe, the, the, the place where the human drama is worked out. And then so we have this, the spirit self will be worked out in a new Jupiter phase and then eventually a new Venus phase and then finally this planet called Vulcan here. Um, so that's the overarching macrocosmic view. Um, let's see. Let's take a look at this little diagram over here of now his post-Atlantean epochs. He has the myth of Atlantis. Uh, he's got a Polarian and a Hyperborean epoch, and then Atlantis, and then Atlantis crashes and sinks. Probably just a myth, but a myth that makes possible uh, 
other kinds of insights. So here we have the ancient Indian epoch, 7893 BC, which is an absurd. Nothing was going on in India <clears throat> that far back. Um, it's all Neolithic architecture, uh, you know, mud brick and adobe huts and so forth. Um, <clears throat> then we've got the ancient Persian epoch, 5733 uh, BC. Again, too far back. And here then, so we have the Egypto-Chaldean, or let's say the Egypto-Mesopotamian epoch. And now we're getting somewhere. 2970 BC is correct. So he's made a mistake here. These two epochs are both Indo-Aryan, and they belong after this epoch with the Egypto-Chaldean Babylonian, uh, because the Indo-Aryan invasions did not take place until about 2000 BC, 2000 to 1500 right in there during that troubled second millennium. So the model needs to be revised. Then we have the Greco-Roman epoch coming in 747 BC, about the time of Homer, um, and the present culture epoch, he thinks, began in 1413 AD, about the time of the Renaissance and the figuring out of depth perspective and painting. And then there will be a sixth cultural epoch, a Russian one, 3573 AD, and then eventually another American epoch, 5067 AD. So interesting. Um, so that's his sort of post-Atlantean epochs. And then we can look at them this way. This is the V-shaped arc. And each one of these epochs, again, develops the architecture of the subtle body. With the Indian epoch, their job was to develop the etheric body. And the etheric body has to do with prana. It has to do with pranic energies, but it also has to do with memory. And uh, the Indian civilization created a prodigious feat of memory. Um, they memorized all their texts. Most of them were not written down until the British got there. Um, and it, it was quite a feat. Um, so that makes sense. And the Persian epoch developed the astral body, which is where the passions and desires come in, where you get these dualistic wars between beings like Araman on the one hand, who is the god of matter, and Ahura Mazda on the other, who is the god of light. So you get this idea of warring passions, which corresponds to the astral, astral body very well. And then the Egypto-Chaldean epoch, the sentient soul was developed. And the sentient soul <clears throat> is that part of the soul which has to do with the senses, but also with images and myths. And myths are based on images. And so this is a mythical phase of civilization par excellence. And then the nadir comes with the Greco-Roman epoch, where the intellectual soul was worked out. But this was a degenerate period for Steiner, uh, so degenerate that the Christ event had to come down. Uh, Christ is a being who came down from the sun, and his blood, when it hit the earth, actually changed the earth's vibratory frequency because it generated so much love and compassion for him. And that tuned the frequency of the earth to a higher vibe and made it possible Lots of energies for our epoch, which is he's calling here Germanic Celtic, uh, where the spirit self uh, is developed, the manas, and then um, the Serbian epoch, I don't know why it's Serbian, it should be Russian, will de develop the life spirit, and finally the American e epoch will develop the atma, or the spirit man. So each one of these uh, civilizations develops a different aspect of the of the subtle body all right so let's look at his angelology here um uh, let's start from the top and this is an adaptation of saint dionysius uh his celestial hierarchies at the top we have the seraphim in the first hierarchy and they're all in groups of three the seraphim are spirits of love their idea is to receive the ideas of the trinity or in other words to receive the ideas from God, the God being, uh, the prime source energy creator, and the cherubim, or spirits of harmony as he names them, uh, their job is to ponder over the ideas, and the thrones or the spirits of will, then transform these ideas into action. This is a little bit comparable with Plotinus's model, where he has noose, 
um, he has the one, let's say, his version of the God idea. Um, then the next level down is the noose, the cosmic mind. That's where all the ideas come from. But noose is incorruptible, but static. Whereas those ideas have to be put into, let's say platonic ideas, have to be put into action by the anima mundi, which is incorruptible, but active. So it, it begins to translate those ideas, uh, getting them ready to incarnate on the earth. And so the next hierarchy, we have the, the Kyriotets, which are the spirits of wisdom. Uh, and what they do, actually what Steiner means by wisdom is that everything it has wisdom in it. Um, you pick up a seashell and see the wisdom in its design. You take a leaf and look, look at it under a microscope. Look at all the wisdom in there, in its design. Everything is permeated with wisdom. Uh, and that's the job of the, the Kyriotets. And the Dynamis are spirits of motion. Their job is to um, regulate Gaia, basically. The continual movement and metamorphosis in our planet of air, water, and vegetation. The Dynamis handle the, the Earth's metabolism. Um, its home ability to you know, have the constant concentration of oxygen at 21%, uh, the salinity of the oceans, all that is held together by the dynamis. Um, and then the exousiae, which are spirits of form, and their actual task is to create the solar system. They're the ones who bring all this into a physical, concrete manifestation. So then the third hierarchy, which is the closest to the humans, are the three classic ranks of the angels, the archai, which are spirits of personality, but they're really spirits of time. And what they do is they handle uh, the zeitgeist of an age. Um, each age has its own zeitgeist going across the planet, and the archai are in charge of that. Let's say in the age of the 12th century, um, when uh, the troubadours were writing their love poetry, the whole planet was intoxicated by the idea of love and sex. And uh, um, the Arabs coming up, bringing the, the story of Layla and Majnun. Um, then across to India with uh, Jayadeva writing the Gita Govinda and Krishna as this god who attracts all these women. And also the creation of their pornographic temples is going on there and they're developing tantric and Lady Mirasaki in Japan is writing the tale of Genji. The whole planet, uh, the archai of that epoch was in charge of that, that vibratory frequency that went across the board. And now with the archangels, they are specifically spirits of specific people. This corresponds to Spangler's idea that each civilization has its own informing idea. The idea of the West is infinite space. So the archangel in, ch in charge of that idea is the unifying principle for that uh, civilization. But for the Meiji and Judeo-Christian Islamic civilization, the indwelling idea is the world cavern and the struggle between light and darkness. So that would be the archangel in charge of that. So the archangel comes up with the central earth symbols um, in each of these civilizations that hold them together, that sort of gives them the glue uh, what Ibn Khaldun called Asabia, the glue that keeps a people together. Um, and then we have angels, and angels at this level are, um, each of us has our own angels, and they guide our own individual spiritual development and supervise our incarnation from one uh, incarnation to the next. And then we have human beings, uh, which is our job to evolve to evolve through the seven planetary stages. We, we still have a few more, as we have seen. Um, so this is his angelology. And now I want to conclude and get to the punchline here with this idea that so each of these angels, these archangels, are in charge of a specific epoch. Um, and the epoch from 225 B.C. to 225 A.D. was ruled by Oriphiel, and under his rule, humans are crude and savage. He is the archangel of suffering. He bestows pain upon humanity so that we can learn. 
um, learning hurts. That's why we have suffering and pain. The notable achievement here is, of course, the crucifixion of Christ, who came down into this terrible situa situation with the Romans, watching people die in their gladiatorial arenas. Um, they were almost barbarians, the Romans. They, they were pretty, pretty uh, degenerate. And the second archangel comes in, 225 to 525 AD, is called Anael. And under his rule, human beings begin to resurface from their lower ways now because of the Christ event to a more comfortable station. They begin to relearn the gentle ways of the soul. Buddhism now spreads. Um, Ashoka, who dates from this time, 200 AD, uh, is the first Caesar figure in India. He conquers all of India and then converts to Buddhism. Um, so this is in Christianity is getting up and running here with a religion of love and tolerance, at least ideally, if not in practice. But um, the third archangel that ruled from 525 to 825 AD is called Zakariel, and he's the archangel of civilization. So now civilization is getting back up and running. Uh, 750 is the date for Charlemagne, in his rediscovery of the Roman Empire and wanting to bring back uh, classicism. Um, he created a, a kind of a, a, a school. He brought uh, learned Irish monks over, like Alcuin, um, all these monks to get us out of the Dark Age and get civilization up and running again. And then the fourth archangel is called Raphael, and he ruled from 825 AD to 1125 AD. So that's a significant period when the West is getting up and running, civilization is back up and running. We're getting our first sort of renaissance uh, at the end of the high Middle Ages here. 1125 is approaching the age of the writing of the Grail Romances, which date from 1180 to 1210. Um, uh, things are starting to get sophisticated here under, under Raphael because he's the archangel of invention and knowledge. And then, of course, it should be no surprise that... Um, the fourth, let's see, the fourth archangel, the fifth archangel is called Samael. Um, from 1125 to about 1525, Steiner sometimes gives us the date, 1510. Um, every time Samael governs the world, a complete change occurs in some great monarchy or government. And this is the age where what, Car what Quigley would call a brand new instrument of expansion uh, the first instrument of expansion was feudalism under uh, Charlemagne. Um, that degenerated in, or petrified into chivalry. And when a, a, an instrument of expansion petrifies, um, there are three responses. You can either circumvent it, as the British did with the monarchy. They just left it intact and created uh, parliament. Or you can re rebel against it, as Luther rebelled against the church, um, tried to reform it or as the church did in response, counter-reform counter it, uh, a reactionary. Let's start burning people now. So those are the three ways to go around an instrument of expansion. But for Quigley, the new instrument of expansion that comes in right about 1500 is the invention of commercial capitalism by the Venetians and the Genoese. They're trading goods, goods that are already made with it's India, you know, teak wood, rose wood, ambergris, uh, salt and pepper, uh, all kinds of things like that. So a brand new instrument of expansion comes in under Samael, uh, who governs the, the, the sort of paradigm shift. He's like the angel of paradigm shifts. And then uh, the sixth archangel is Gabriel from 1525 to 1879. And he is, of course, the god of uh, angel of communications. And that's when uh, the printing press comes in. Just, just ahead of that, right on the cusp of it. Now we get the printing press. We get the dissemination of writing, reading. Uh, a whole another instrument of expansion comes in with the book. And knowledge begins to spread like a wildfire during this period under Gabriel. Um, he sort of replaces Mercury in the old pantheon. And then finally we have um, Michael comes in. 1879, um, and this is the, the point that I wanted to get to, uh, because under his rulership, Steiner says that human beings go through great inner and outer awakenings, 
Now, this is the period of the descent of the West into materialism. And note that that date corresponds exactly, more or less, to Gene Gebser's idea of the shift from the late uh, perspectival phase of the uh, men mental consciousness structure to the integral consciousness structure, and also the same date that Spangler sees, on the other hand, as a decline, as the beginnings of the decline of the West into materialism and a shallow, extensive worldview replacing an intensive metaphysical one. And I think that Steiner would agree with him on this. Michael comes in, though, as, in, in a way, the same way Christ descended down uh, into the degenerate Greco-Roman period, especially the Roman period, uh, to transform it. It was stuck in materialism and atheism also, as we have been since 1879, and Michael entered the earth to change, uh, to change that. And I want to conclude by reading a couple paragraphs here from uh, the Archangel Michael, his mission and ours, where he says, the year 1879 marks an epoch of the greatest significance in the evolution of humanity because of an event that took place on the astral plane. Since that event, our civilization has taken a different direction. A certain spiritual stream began to flow in the year 1250 and reached its height in 1459 when Christian Rosenkreutz was raised to the rank of Knight of the Rose Cross. In 1510, the age known in occultism as the Age of Gabriel began. The Age of Michael began in 1879, and after that comes, once again, full circle, the Age of Oriphiel, when great conflicts will rage among human beings. Recall that we started with Oriphiel, who was the presiding spirit uh, during the Greco-Roman period, uh, an age of degeneracy, but especially the Roman. Therefore, a tiny handful of human beings is now being prepared to keep the torch of spiritual light in the somber epoch, almost like the, the idea, uh, like William Irma Thompson's idea of Lindisfarne, um, monks keeping uh, a small group of them, keeping hold of writing while civilization disintegrates around them. And then one other thing here, he says, all culture originates in the spiritual world. That is where the planets are formed, and they in turn determine the course of our lives on the physical plane. Here on the earth, we merely witness the way in which one event follows the other according to physical laws, while the great spiritual causes remain hidden from us. But the events that occur on the higher planes of our being are the real cause of physical events. And um, one last thing here. Uh, he says, All the European esoteric schools say that the bacterial illnesses of modern times, those caused by bacilli, have a similar origin which can be traced back to the spiritual world. This is an esoteric tradition among Rosicrucians and in other esoteric schools where such things are taught. A fundamental teaching exists in small circles of esoteric schools which states that in the 70s, uh, the 1870s, quite definite battles took place in the astral world which caused things to take a turn. These events are called the battle between the hosts of the archangel known to Christian esotericism as Michael and the hosts of the god Mammon. Mammon is the god of hindrances who places destructive hindering things in the path of progress. Furthermore, this god Mammon is seen as the creator of quite definite forms which work disturbingly in human life precisely in the sphere of infectious diseases. Certain infectious diseases unknown in earlier times are brought about by the god Mammon. One thinks of the massive flu epidemic that hit right after World War I uh, and killed uh, millions of people. Um, so these events, the world wars were not an accident. According to Steiner, there was a war in heaven between Michael and Mammon um, that drove certain beings out and they incarnated on the physical plane and uh, we got the world wars and the, the destruction of the what Heidegger would call the metaphysical age, that, that was it. But it was preceded by a struggle on the astral plane between these beings, and then Michael deciding to descend into the Earth's etheric body in 1879 uh, to try to change the vibratory frequency so that once the wars were over, there would be spiritual currents now, and there were, and there were a lot of them, or Sri Aurobindo, not just Steiner, Aurobindo, Teilhard de Chardin, um, Carl Jung, uh, Gene Gebser, a whole bunch of spiritual streams 
were going on as the result of Michael's dissemination of his energy. And um, it doesn't matter, by the way, what you call these beings. They don't have names. We refer to them as Michael and Gabriel out of convention, just so we know who, who they're talking about, but they don't have the actual names. Um, so that's it. I just wanted to go over Steiner's idea of the descent of Michael uh, in 1879 and uh, what resulted from all that.